This is Saturday night. Saturday night at the movies. <laughs> Saturday at the, at the Krishna's. Message of Krishna consciousness. One of the, the, the questions that arises for people that are new to Krishna consciousness or considering Krishna consciousness at that stage, so you may not be at that stage, but you may be um, interacting with people from time to time or at that stage. Is this really practical? For our modern time, something that's 5,000 years old, it was good for people 5,000 years ago, but is it, is it relevant and relatable and practical in our modern time? Maybe you've asked that question, maybe you've heard that question asked, and that's the, the question we're going to be discussing, and then carry a little bit further beyond that. The practical application part. If the children need a place to play, it's probably best to have a little room. They can close the door and chitter-chatter all day long. You're very peaceful. Thank you for being so peaceful. Let's see how long it lasts. <laughs> okay, this is our founder Acharya. His divine grace is Bhaktivedanta Swami. Srila Prabhupada, who brought us this process of devotional service uh, using modern methods like airplanes and airports and all kinds of facilities that are part of this world. Yukta Vairagya is the language of Rupa Goswami. Vairagya means renunciation, so traditionally, traditionally, at least certain groups of people in India viewed that a renunciate, a vairagi, should never cross the ocean and should never do anything but walk, and never ride in conveyances and things like that. But Rupa Goswami taught that that kind of renunciation is incomplete. Uh, Hari Sambandha Vastuna, things, Vastu, substances or objects or stuff that has Hari Sambandha, relationship with Hari, and you give it up, that's uh, Palgu Vairagya, false renunciation. And complete renunciation is um, without the mood of trying to be the enjoyer of that stuff or that something. Um, Anasaptasya Vishayan, without attachment to sense enjoyment. Yatarhan Upayunjitaha, Nirbandha. Krishna Sambande, Yuktam Vairagya Uchate. Nice verse, very important verse in our lives as followers of Bhagavad Gita and followers of the teacher of Bhagavad Gita. Um, without attachment or without the in, in, enjoyment mood of utilizing things, things that have their relationship with Krishna use them in service to Krishna, that's um, complete renunciation. So practical spirituality in our modern time deploys that principle. It requires proper understanding, it requires many things, but it's a principle. So Srila Prabhupada is in a photograph here standing in line like so many other business people, there's his servant right behind him, um, standing in line for checking in at an airport. 
practical spirituality. Uh, the wisdom that we're going to be discussing is based on Krishna's teaching in Bhagavad Gita. And so we're offering our respects to our founder, Acharya, and to this wonderful teaching of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, some people ask this question, we'll start with, who is it for? And then, is it practical? Some people think Bhagavad Gita is what's something to do when you get old. Old people may contemplate spirituality. When you're young, you do other things. Or some people think it's what you do before you have it again. <clears throat> During some part of my life as a sannyasi, I was visiting this Pilani, most of you from India, you know that name. It's, it's, so, it's so much branded that they are opening a branch in Hyderabad and calling it this Pilani in Hyderabad. So, at this Pilani in Pilani, on campus there's a temple of Saraswati. And the students told me, before every exam and after every exam, we go to the goddess of Saraswati temple, a goddess Saraswati temple, and offer our prayers that we can do well in our exam. The rest of the time they don't go, but they exam time. So some people think that's what getting praying to God is for, what you do before exams. Or maybe it's what some people think is what you do when you get some critical illness, and then you pray and people pray for you, and it, it, at least it intensifies significantly during those circumstances of life. And some people think that spirituality is just for monks and renunciates and, and priests. That's what those people do, and then other people, it's not so much for them. Uh, however, Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna right in the middle of the battlefield. So there's no exam, there's no sickness, and there's no old age. And there's no uh, being a monk on the battlefield. In fact, uh, when Krishna spoke Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, Arjuna was a great hero, a commander of armies of men, millions of warriors ready on his command to fight. Powerful personality. He was a householder. Not only he was a householder leading family life, he had multiple wives. He wasn't a monk. And personality-wise, he wasn't like a meek, trembling, meager, personality. He was a very powerful, strong warrior. So some people may say, well, that's nice. That's, it's for Arjuna because he was in the middle of the battlefield, but at least I don't have any plan to get in the middle of the battlefield, so is it really relevant to me? Well, one way of looking at the battlefield of our lives is the battlefield of our mind. And we have many battles. I, I can recall a few of them that I had today <laughs> within the mind. But the, the instructions of Bhagavad Gita are there for that purpose also. Not the literal, but the figurative battlefield. Life is like that. So how are we supposed to apply this teaching of Bhagavad Gita when, look at that maze, you know what a maze is. Have you seen one of these before? You have like, you know, two-dimensional two ones. You, this is a three-dimensional maze. Kids, money, can't even read it. Play, home, play. what's this one? Lifestyle. Lifestyle. Very complex. So what, how you, is it really practical? 
Are you supposed to go to the board meeting and sit and do your yoga asana right in the middle of the board meeting? Is that really practical? You get fired. Is it practical? We, our lives are really busy. Is there really time for all of this? And our roles and responsibilities? You know, our young people here, we have a lot of homework. Yes? And as you go into high school, they can have more homework, and you go into college, more homework, and graduate school. And, but, you know, then we have, what happens after that? Then you have a job, and then marriage, and children, and you know, your roles and responsibilities may be significant now, but as you get a, go along in life, it gets more and more. Is it really practical, this message of Bhagavad Gita? You have life situations are so complicated. Is spirituality, according to the teaching of Bhagavad Gita, really practical? Somebody may ask that question. Um, well, one of the messages that Bhagavad Gita very clearly gives, and the rest of the Vedic literature is, it's not that your roles and responsibilities and your job are something that you're supposed to be giving up, nor your true personality. In fact, it's to discover your true personality instead of the cosmetic one, or the one that's just pasted on and keep, people keep trying this one and that one for style and fashion and never really fits. They try another one. It doesn't require that. That kind of renunciation. Um, it can be practiced at any age, any circumstance, any time. Literally. It's a principle of life it's not, um, it doesn't require this artificial renunciation idea. It's easy for a number of reasons, but one of them is, as Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, and those that apply the teachings properly, they find it gives a, a natural happiness from within. Just a little sharing. We have some time for that. I was attending um, a, 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 a Bhakti Vriksha gathering of several Bhakti Vriksha groups in, in one town. And um, the facilitator of that particular Bhakti Vriksha group that was the host, and the other ones were in the room, he started the way that he normally starts, which is. Where's Great to Tony? Um, icebreaker. So his icebreaker was Would anybody like to share some experience that you had this week based on you know, the message of Bhagavad Gita? Something like that. So one man was, he had his hand up even before he finished the question. He was waving his hand. So he got called on first. And he started describing like this. He said, since I was very young, I always had some attraction for Bhagavad Gita. So wherever there was an opportunity for Bhagavad Gita study, I'd go. To be honest with you, I never really understood Bhagavad Gita in part because I don't think the group understood Bhagavad Gita, but I kept going anyways. And then I finished my education I got a job here in America, and uh, I, tr you know, lived here and then lived there. And I heard some gatherings in this area, so I thought, sure, I'll go take this Bhagavad Gita study group. So I started coming, and something started to happen. I started to understand Bhagavad Gita that I could never understand before, and I felt really good about that. And then there's another thing that started to happen, which is. I have this anger problem. He said, it's not like, you know, I go and yell at people and yell at my kids and yell at my wife. And, you know, it's not like that. But there's something that just like irked me. You know, like in the 
he just kept going like this. <laughs> in the workplace, you know, when, when, when there's something goes wrong and everyone's faulting everybody else and backbiting and doing that thing, you know, it would just make me angry and think, just why don't you just get the job done instead of wasting your time doing all that nasty negative stuff and get angry. But I've only been coming for about six, seven weeks and that anger that's been with me my whole life, it's just kind of dissipated. I look at myself and say, what happened? Because <laughs> I took anger management courses and this and that and nothing seemed to work and just studying Bhagavad Gita. But studying Bhagavad Gita with people that understand Bhagavad Gita. So I just wanted to share that. It was, it was pretty impressive because here I am so much later remembering that sharing. And so many other, you know, human interest stories like that. It, it, it's, it's practical. This is practical. When you can get a hold of your life from the inside and then from the outside. You can live your life um, more productively, more peacefully, etc. Family and everything. Words a higher taste. There's a verse like that in Bhagavad Gita, Pram Drishtva Navartate. So the struggles are with the lower nature. When we try to give up something that's of a lower nature, but when the mind continues to dwell on that something that's of a lower nature, it's, we find ourselves back in that something again. But it's easy to give it up when there's a higher taste, Krishna says. That's the spiritual contentment from the previous one. Now this, that the higher taste means your life can become clean instead of cluttered or impure. Our life energy becomes vitalized and it awards more efficiency in your daily life. Here's a little more sharing, just to embellish this. When I was in college, once upon a time I was in college, and um, I had met devotees. In fact, one of those devotees I met was Srila Prabhupada. At least he came to our campus and there was a, a center uh, right across the street from campus, down half a block. And so I started getting involved in Krishna consciousness. And um, my academic work was substantial, but I really wanted, I was very committed to um, learning and exploring spirituality. So I started chanting. So many things. But, so I was chanting eight rounds a day. And I heard the Bhoti speaking about 16 rounds a day, and I thought, how is this possible? 16 rounds a day, that takes two hours. And I've got all this work to do. How's it going to happen? How's it going to happen? And just, just pondering it, rather than being negative about it, I said, let me, let me try. So I just jumped in the pool and started chanting 16 rounds. And what I found from chanting 16 rounds was there was so much spiritually energized that uh, that two hours that it took, actually went from four to 16, that two hours that it took to chant, it reduced the amount of sleep that I needed by two hours. I didn't try like that, it's just, I was energized. And because I was energized by chanting 16 rounds, then the academic work that I did after that got done in a fraction of the time that it would take would have taken otherwise. Then I had some time for reading. So my life became more efficient. I was far more focused, far more contented, just from the, the activities of Sadhana Bhakti. It's not imaginary, it's not uh, you know, false advertisement or something. It's, it's genuine. If one applies oneself, the soul connects the, the, the source of everything, Krishna, you become spiritually energized. 
you become more effective, not less. And practical, it's very simple. This is a verse from Bhagavad Gita, Tasmat Sarveshu Kaleshu. Always think of me, Krishna is instructing Arjuna, always think of me in the form of Krishna and at the same time carry out your prescribed duty. Now, Arjuna's prescribed duty was fighting. Maybe there's somebody in here that's a fighter by profession. And if not, then whatever your profession is, fill in that blank. Do that for Krishna. If you're a student, be a student for Krishna. If you're a whatever it is, your housewife, be a housewife for Krishna. Whatever it is, do that for Krishna. Perform your prescribed duties for Krishna. And at the same time, always think of him. Mahadusmara. Always think of Krishna and engage in your prescribed duties. Very simple. Not so difficult. Always think of Krishna. How do you always think of something? You always think of something when you're attached to that something. Supposing you're a miser. You always think of your money. I had this interesting, another anecdote, I had this interesting experience. Um, flying from Chicago, believe it or not, a storm came. So they had us get in the plane, and rather than lose our spot for takeoff, they decided to go out, because it wasn't like terrible, terrible, just go out on the, on, on the runway rather than have us come back and declaim the plane. Go out on the runway. And so I was seated on an aisle seat and there was a Jewish businessman in, next to me and his wife next to her, him. And this was one of those planes, the older planes that had phones and it, it said, what's going on with the stock market? So he, we're sitting on the runway and he pulls out the thing, so finds out what's on the stock market, gets on the cell phone, tells his, his people back in New York, buy some of these and sell some of those, click. They're like, it's just absorbed the money. As soon as the plane landed, you can turn on your cell phone. How did it go? How much did it clear? Oh, we got a profit. And I can understand this man probably dreams these things in his in sleep. Because what you're attached to is where your thoughts go. Etc. Etc. One devotee day, today was telling me they have dreams of the deity that they worship in their home because they worship for so many hours every day. At night they have dreams of, the, of dressing and worshiping their deity. Naturally, it happens. What you're attached to is where your mind goes. So, to always think of Krishna, it's very simple, become attached to Krishna. Well, the difficulty with becoming attached to Krishna is we're attached to non-Krishna. <coughs> or seeing stuff, vastu, separate from Krishna. Instead of Hari Sambandha, we're seeing stuff for grabs, and we become attached to it. it. doesn't belong to anybody, I'll make it mine. And become proprietary about those things, and then suffer. So that's Bhagavad Gita's message, and it's the method. The method of how to do that is quite simple. Here's one: you make offerings to Krishna, patram pushpam palam toyam. Very simple. Offer with love and devotion. Leaf, flower, fruit, or, fruit or water. Very easily available items, and simply offer with love and devotion to Krishna. And if you don't just do mechanically, but you do with love and devotion then you, you're connected with Krishna. And when you're connected with Krishna, you're thinking of Krishna, and eventually you become attached to Krishna. This devotee I was speaking to today was saying, they're very attached to their deity. They've been worshipping their deity for years and years, and without going into it, the reciprocation is there. Attachment is there, and mutual reciprocation is there. Not just you become attached to Krishna. Krishna becomes attached to the devotee who loves Krishna and is attached to Krishna. It's reciprocal. 
So it's, it's about relationships. This is what Krishna is asking for when he's asking surrender. It's not simply obedience, it's a relationship. And we ask Krishna similarly for a relationship. And it's practical for those who are in household life, and it's practical for those who are renounced, renounced life. The form may look different, the essence is the same. So, what about when? Well, Srimad Bhagavatam teaches us that it's from the tender age of childhood, that's how Prabhupada has translated this, Komara, Asharet Pragyo. Komara is the age just after five, like when a boy goes to school. Even in Vedic culture, boys went to school at five. That's when Bala changes into Kumara age. So it's school age. The tender age of childhood, that's when to begin. This is Prabhat instructing his classmates when Shanda and Amarka, the school teachers, stepped out of the classroom. And he's instructing them, no, no, you, do, you want to play, but now is the time to practice bhakti. So it's never too early and it's never too late. I will spare telling you some it's never too late stories. They're pretty interesting. Um, but at the same time it's certainly important, in fact it's urgent and we should make it a priority. So now how do you get involved in all of this? We have our Bhagavad Gita in front of us. And how are we supposed to uh, approach its message and the process that's described within it? Well, when you start looking in Bhagavad Gita, you'll find out that just as Krishna is instructing Arjuna, because disciplic succession is, has been broken, so he's restoring disciplic succession, Similarly, the scriptures teach us that there are these bona fide disciplic successions, four in number, Brahma Sampradaya, etc., that are still intact today. In the Padma Purana, there's this very specific verse. Um, in the age of Kali, four Vaishnavas Sampradayas will purify the earth. These are known as the Sri Brahma Rudra and Sanaka or the Kumara Sampradaya. Directly from Padma Purana. So these four disciplic successions I've shown, and each of these four disciplic successions have a principal Acharya who took the, those teachings that have come down in descending fashion and um, presented them in a systematic manner and then from them others in line of disciplic succession. Uh, there is a nice verse from the Upanishads, Mundaka Upanishad specifically, that says this word Abhigachchet in the verse is, I learned this by hearing this from Prabhupada, dozens of times, Abhigachchet is, is the, the gr grammar means it's imperative, it's not optional. So, Tadvigyanartam, those that want in relation to Bhagavat Tattva, Vastu,